Coming up on DTNS, Facebook wants to hire thousands of Europeans to create the metaverse, whatever it turns out to be. Foxconn wants to build you a car, and Apple announces new M1 chips and MacBook Pros for them to go inside. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 18th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, I'm Rich Straffolino. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, and it's an Apple announcement day, which means we have Nika Monford with us. Hey, Nika. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. Glad to talk some Apple announcement. And of course, Nika, one of the hosts of the Snob OS podcast, the other one, Terrence Gaines, a.k.a. Brother Tech. Welcome Yo. back, Terrence. How's everybody going out there? We're doing good. We're doing good. Uh, we were just having a good conversation about uh, what laptops we may or may not have bought already, uh, the chips that go inside them. If you want that wider conversation, Roger was doing a really good explanation of the RAM and the and the bandwidth effects and the chips. Uh, get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Yes, you can join other top patrons like Tony Glass, Philip Less, and Daniel Dorado. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. A joint cybersecurity advisory from the FBI, NSA, CISA, and the EPA disclosed that in March, July, and August, seemingly unrelated ransomware organizations hit water and waste treatment facilities in Nevada, Maine, and California, respectively. Got all that? These attacks led to file encryption at all sites, with one facility seeing a SCADA industrial equipment computer corrupted. The advisory cautioned this does not represent an uptick in cyber activity against the water system. Following Reuters' report on Amazon's program of copying products in India, a bipartisan group of five members of the U.S. House Judiciary Committee sent a letter to Amazon CEO Andy Jassy accusing Amazon of misleading or possibly even lying to Congress about Amazon's business practices. Amazon now has until November 1st to provide a sworn response to clarify how it uses seller data to develop its own products and requests all documents mentioned in the Reuters investigation. The Tor sites belonging to the Revil ransomware operation went offline, with Revil posting on the forum XSS it had its domains hijacked. The post said there was no sign of compromise to Revil servers, but that it was had to shut down operations anyway. Current Revil affiliates were told to contact the operators over the messaging app Tox for campaign decryption keys. Customer service. Yeah, oh, look at that. The automaker Stellantis and LG Energy Solution announced a joint venture to produce EV battery cells in North America. This would see a new battery factory built and operating by Q1 2024 with an annual capacity of 40 gigawatt hours, roughly a, on par with the Panasonic Tesla Gigafactory. That's over there in Sparks, Nevada. No word on a specific location for this new one, but construction should start in Q2 2022. And in related new Toyota news, Toyota announced it would invest $3.4 billion in battery development and production in the U.S. through the end of the decade. That includes $1.3 billion electric vehicle battery plant expected to begin production in 2025 and further expanding in 2031. Expected watt-hour production and the location of that factory are not yet known. The Wall Street Journal reported Sunday that Facebook internal documents say that two years ago, Facebook reduced the number of internal reviewers focused on hate speech complaints. The documents also appear to show that Facebook made other adjustments that reduced the number of complaints, making it appear that its algorithms were more successful at removing hate speech than it actually was. The document showed algorithms actually removed between 3 and 5% of hate speech views. Monday, Facebook Vice President of Integrity Guy Rosen says the company doesn't focus on hate speech's existence, but how often it's seen. He, rewrote, uh, he wrote that for every 10,000 views of a piece of content on Facebook, five reviews of hate speech, and that the prevalence had dropped 50% over the past three years. Okay. Well, we got we got more Facebook news to go with that. Uh, so before we start talking about it, tell us what that is, Rich. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the metaverse, you know, we kind of teased at the start of the show. It's just a buzzword for now. It means kind of whatever you want it to mean. But for Facebook, it means it's a way to inhabit a shared virtual world that it hopes to see realized in 10 to 15 years. To that end, it announced it will hire 10,000 people in Europe to help build the metaverse. A recruiting drive will take place across Europe, including France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, and Spain. Facebook has already built out an AI research uh, AI research in Europe, including a reality lab in Cork, a research lab in France, and a partnership with the Technical University of Munich on an AI ethics research center. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, culling the Europeans to build uh, the metaverse, uh, you know, what what could what could go wrong here? Yeah. 
Bloomberg has a really good uh, explanation of, of what the metaverse is and is not, because uh, <laughs> there isn't a, a definition. There's there's lots of definitions. Uh, and it feels like Facebook is championing this to kind of deflect and say, yeah, but we're future focused. We're we're building the the future. My guess is they were going to hire about 10,000 AI experts in, in, in Europe anyway. Did, Terrence, do, do you feel any differently about that? Well, I'm just trying to figure out, is just metaverse just another word for virtual reality, or is there something more involved? Is it? I mean, sure. Right. Yes and no. <laughs> right. Like, it, it, it's, it's whatever they want it to be, right? right? I mean, the idea, I get the idea of the metaverse, which is, oh, Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, the ability to, like, have a virtual avatar that's like the real world, but it all takes place over connected, you know, internet connected devices, et cetera. I mean, I get that, but what it actually ends up being or not, I mean, nobody really knows yet. Well, and that's what kind of makes it, you know, putting it 10 to 15 years out, Facebook can, at that time, take that time, 10,000 people, they can do a lot of work clearly with that. And, you know, and kind of at the end of 10 to 15 years, kind of rubber stamp whatever they have as the metaverse said, we did it, you got it, <laughs> no problem, uh, we got it. What I do think is interesting though is, Facebook is very quick to kind of couch this as, listen, we want to create this just like the early internet was. This needs to be open. This needs to be collaborative. It's not just a Facebook thing. We need collaboration from different companies, developers. So not making it seem like this monolithic social network is creating this monolithic VR, you know, walled garden, uh, for lack of a better term. And that th this is something somehow different from that. Now, you know, current the the first stabs at the metaverse kind of have been very Oculus VR focused. Yes, they have integration with third party companies like Zoom and stuff like that, which is, you know, key I guess for for kind of expanding that. Um, you know, we will see how how much those those bona fides uh, actually play out, though. Nico, are you excited knows? for the metaverse? Um, I don't know. I'm always a bit skeptical, especially lately when it comes to Facebook, and who knows what space we're going to be in in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, so it always is kind of one of those things that I kind of, you know, couch in the back of my mind of, okay, it sounds kind of cool now, but what is this really going to look like in 10 to 15 years? How much more power is Facebook going to amass over the next 10 to 15 years? And if they're saying, you know, it's, we're open sourcing it, sourcing it. it's not just a Facebook thing. It's, yeah, you can say that, but how proprietary if you bring in other developers or other people outsourced, are you going to try and claim ownership of that? Is that still going to fall into the, you know, Facebook ecosystem of Instagram, WhatsApp or whatever else they could be building, you know, behind the scenes that they haven't announced yet. So I take it all honestly quite skeptically and uh, I'll just kind of have to see, you know, how it <laughs> plays out because I'm not so yeah. sure. <laughs> A ask AOL and CompuServe how well their plans were 10 to 15 years later. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I'm not saying the metaverse is dumb or that it won't happen. I, I think it's great and I think it will. And and I'm not 100% certain that Facebook is the one that's going to make it happen. They, they certainly will contribute in the early days, but a lot of time left. Yeah, we know. definitely. All right. Well, our next story here, uh, Foxconn is a company that's known for assembling Apple products and more, announced three electric vehicle prototypes that it's building. The cars were developed under the Foxconn brand in cooperation with Taiwan's Yulon Motor Company, which also makes Nissan and Mitsubishi vehicles. The new EVs are sedans called the Model E, an SUV called the Model C, and a transit bus called, wait for it, the Model T. All the vehicles use Foxconn's MIH consortium open software and hardware platform. The prototypes are meant to serve as a reference design for EV brands to use to make their own cars. So some details uh, here. Uh, the sedan was uh, designed by Pina Ferrania, Ferrania excuse me, as a luxury model with 750 horsepower and delivers a 0 to 62 mile per hour time of 2.8 seconds, aka fast, along with a 750 kilometer range. The SUV will do 0 to 62 in 3.8 seconds and cost around $30. $35,700. Yulon will make a version available in Taiwan by 2023, and the bus will hit a top speed of 75 miles per hour with a range of 400 kilometers and include tech for things like pedestrian warnings, advanced temperature management, and high crashworthiness, meaning in the event of a crash, there'll be fewer injuries as a result. The bus is supposed to be on the road as early as next year. 
Foxconn plans to build plants to make the vehicles near where they are sold. It hopes to announce European plants soon. It plans to build some in the U.S. as well, including acquiring a plant in Lordstown, Ohio, where it will build Fisker EVs by late 2023. They're going to be doing that after they're also going to be building the Lordstown electric truck uh, there or Lordstown Motor Motors electric truck there as well. Uh, but, you know, certainly uh, uh, good news and kind of in my neck of the woods uh, for that uh, plant to be seeing some continued usage. But, uh, yeah, uh, Foxconn cars, kind of a, an interesting new direction for, you know, a company we think of making consumer electronics. We all have Foxconn phones. They're just called <laughs> iPhones. We just don't know it, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, so, you know, I, I think this is incredibly smart of Foxconn to be like, hey, you know what we're good at? Uh, working with clients uh, to create efficient, high-quality products. It's been consumer electronics uh, for the most part up until now, but it could also be cars. Uh, and and so again, they've got that Foxtron brand, but I wouldn't expect to see a lot of Foxtron dealerships uh, showing up on Van Nuys Boulevard in, in Los Angeles anytime soon. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing this is this is their way of saying, hey, you you want to get into the car building business? Maybe Apple, maybe somebody else. You know, we are we are here to help you do that. And that's what I was going to think, you know, because we're all still up in the air as far as what Apple's going to do. Are they going to make their own? Are they going to partner with somebody? Uh, Foxconn may be putting it out there. It's like, look, we're going to do these trial runs with Taiwan and we're going to do trial runs with this Perineferia, whatever you, whatever the name of that was. But that's the trial run. So when Apple is ready to play ball, we'll let them know that we can get up and running with even plants in America. Yeah, but I guess as well, you won't I, even I, know it was made by Foxconn uh, in the future, except maybe by, uh, the, you know, there may be like an Intel inside marketing thing of like, ah, it's built on the Foxtron platform. And so, you know, you know it's quality when you see that Foxtron sticker on whatever car you're making. I do wonder, though, this is definitely a big pivot for Foxconn. Like, I don't want to uh, under or sell that or like a new market for them, for sure. Uh, but also, I feel like this is a little bit of reflection of kind of the consumer electronification of cars that we've kind of maybe maybe even in just perception as like cars as tech platforms that's kind of become the the standard for how they developed you know tesla kind of paved that route and the fact that they are partnering uh and they're doing this with an established someone that's been making cars with major global brands uh, uh in ulan motors i think that smooths over a lot of the hey we're we you know we focus on this consumer electronic stuff and yeah, we don't know anything about making cars. How are we going to do this? Whereas with that partnership, they have all of that, this huge amount of uh, industrial production and technical expertise and combined with, you know, someone that has automotive manufacturing know-how, you know, I don't, I definitely don't think it's anything to, to take lightly. And if they can, you know, provide, you know, kind of this, this platform to build on for smaller companies like Fisker or something like that, that could be a huge uh, uh, way to jumpstart uh, different electric car brands uh, very quickly. And I think they're just catching on the wave. I mean, pretty much every major car brand is coming out with a line of EVs, some shifting to trying to fully have their full fleet uh, as an EV. Um, so I think they are just trying to hedge their bets to say, hey, we want to get in this game because we see where it's going. What's the best way for us to leverage what we do to get in on some of that action? Yeah. And they they can bring down the cost for other auto manufacturers, Definitely. you know, for, for the Fords and the Hyundais of the world. Uh, although I know transport and transit begins with a T in a lot of languages, but really model T for your bus. Like, <laughs> are you like saying there's a car company that would have an issue with that, Tom? <laughs> well, <laughs> historians will have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no a little pressure. confusion uh, there. Yeah. We are going to talk about the new Apple products, but uh, real quick, uh, if you're interested in the culinary art that is barbecue, uh, but not sure where to start and you're a tech fan, which you obviously are because you're here, you need to listen to Barbecue and Tech. SMR podcast, Chris Ashley and Rod Simmons coming out with a podcast that dives into the techniques and technology that will grow your barbecue skills, whether you're a novice or a seasoned pro. That's Barbecue Tech. First episode is out now. Find it and subscribe bbqandtech.com that's bbqandtech.com go do it now so apple announced some stuff you may have heard about it uh we'll, we'll, we're gonna run through uh some of it and get to the laptops at the end uh first lightning round on, on the early announcements apple music 
announced a new bargain plan uh, below the other two plans. There's the single plan and the family plan uh, called the voice plan for $4.99 a month in 17 countries later this year. You'll be able to get a cheaper version of Apple Music that what they say will only work with Siri. So you, it would be voice control. I can't imagine that's actually like literally true. There's got to be some ways you can interact with it with with text or something. Uh, but But the idea is you don't get to manipulate it. You don't get the higher audio quality. You just say things like help me relax or play some dinner vibes or play a song. And then Siri will curate the music for you, so to speak. Well, I guess it's the popularity will only be how good Apple is in curating the music, right? Spotify is good at that. Some of these other, well, Spotify. Pandora, <laughs> is Pandora's pretty good. Uh, if the playlists are not so good, then what's the point? So we got to really see that's the determining factor for me anyway. I, I'm actually excited by this because one, I feel like this is a swipe almost at like satellite radio. You could pay $5 and have streaming in mm -hmm. your car, even if you don't want to have this overall thing. $5 a month, very inexpensive. And it's also Amazon uh, Music also offers basically it's like a tethered to one uh, Echo device kind of streaming music service exactly like this. But this works across all, anywhere you have Siri, a lot more utility for roughly the same. I don't know exactly what the price of it, but it's very low. Um, so they're not the only ones thinking along these lines. Uh, so I, I think it's it's an interesting move. It's an interesting move. Um, as Terrence mentioned, I'm a little concerned about what the playlist is going to look like. I know on Apple Fitness Plus, some of the playlists are are interesting. So um, I don't know if they have the full, you know, backing of Apple Music's, you know, library to pull from, or if it's a bit more curated, uh, similar that, it, to it, Apple it, Fitness Plus. Yeah, it is able to pull out of the whole library. That is, okay. that, they did say that in the announcement. So yeah, it should, it shouldn't be, <laughs> be limited by, <laughs> by the same problems. But yeah, you know what, uh, Rich, you may be right. Uh, these may be meant for people who buy the new HomePod minis. And by new, I mean new colors, yellow, <laughs> orange, and blue, uh, available <laughs> in November. So there you go. That happened too. Uh, also yeah. got new AirPods, third-gen AirPods with spatial audio, uh, the force sensor, not tapping, kind of like the pros, sweat and water resistant, new low distortion driver that can handle better at the low and the high ends, adaptive EQ, also like the pro. Uh, six hours of listening on a charge, five minute charge gets you an hour of listening. So some fast charging, 30 hours from the case, MagSafe and wireless charging in the case. I mean, basically these are AirPod Pros, but without the custom tips on the end. Uh, and they're cheaper, $179. Uh, you can order them now, ship it next week. The second gen AirPods will stay in the channel at $129. So you'll have three models, AirPods Pro at the top, then AirPod third gen and the original AirPods. I guess it's if you want all the AirPod Pro features and you're willing to give up that that custom tip and save a little money, is that who this is for? Well, uh, so they're offering maybe just a little bit more because the AirPods Pro do not have MagSafe charging. They uh, just have the wireless charging. Mm -hmm. So if I was trying to do some math here, it's like, okay, well, how do I keep my AirPod Pros but still get the MagSafe? Is there a case a MagSafe case available that I can right. buy separately, or do I have to uh, buy the new AirPod Pros and you know with the MagSafe? But in addition to just the custom tips, what the AirPod Pro, the AirPod Three does not have is the active noise cancellation, which is what the custom soft silicone Tip tips provide you is the suction to yeah. get the noise cancellation. So that's the probably the major differentiator. You know, AirPods 3, no noise cancellation. AirPods Pro, active noise cancellation. And then everything else is kind of like, well, you know, price. My, my question is, will these pass the lawn mowing test? Can I wear these blowing my lawn without having to like crank up the volume? My, my humble Galaxy Buds, no active noise cancellation, but they have that firm fit. Does mm -hmm. it like a charm? OG uh, AirPods, doesn't work. Uh, right. So if the adaptive EQ, they can do something with that low distortion driver, you know, maybe. But to me, that fit is is uh, pretty important. Or get you an electric mower, which is what I got oh, recently. Oh, yeah, that's definitely, yeah. That's <laughs> and they, they, they're, the, the volume is way less. On the <laughs> <laughs> and I think these are probably being marketed more towards people who are on either maybe the first or second gen AirPods who maybe want to upgrade to the shorter tip, yeah. shorter case. Um, but for me, the 
for the pros, it's the noise canceling, which is the really that's the that's the key thing. So yeah, you're all you're all right. It's the noise cancellation that's the reason to get the pros. Yeah. Uh, that 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 makes perfect sense. All right, let's get to the laptops. We'll start with the chips. Uh, two new chips. There's the M1 Pro and the M1 Max. The M1 Pro has 200 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth up to 32 gigabytes of unified memory that works across the entire SOC, 33.7 billion transistors, a 10 core CPU, that's eight high performance cores and two efficiency cores that they say is 70% faster than the M1, 16 core GPU on the M1 Pro, that's twice as fast as the M1. Uh, it can do ProRes acceleration in its new media engine, uh, can handle additional Thunderbolt controllers and display engine too that can support multiple displays. We'll get into more of that when we talk about the laptops. And then there's the M1 Max, which basically adds more GPUs uh, and a little more memory bandwidth, 400 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth, twice what the M1 Pro has. The M1 Max can go up to 64 gigabytes of unified memory, 57 billion transistors, same 10 core CPU, eight high performance, two efficiency, but up to 32 core GPU. Uh, they say it's four times faster in graphics than the M1 and the media engine has twice the video encoding. Uh, not as power efficient as the M1, they did a lot of graphs putting it in between the M1 and other unidentified PC chips. As Dieter Bone said on the Verge live blog, I believe Apple is outperforming integrated graphics on Intel machines, but if Apple is this confident, it really shouldn't be afraid to show real numbers uh, instead of those kind of like very relative graphs. Uh, three times faster Core ML than Intel Core i9 Max, though. Uh, there were a few hard numbers in there. And it felt like they were really positioning these chips at video editors. Final Cut Pro, five times faster for some video function. ProRes, transcodes 10 times faster in compressor. Before we get to the actual laptops and the form factors that these chips are in, what, what are your impressions of the chips so far? My, my first thought is that this is a very GPU way to scale uh, uh, your kind of your chip design, or or it's an it's an approach to GPU design as a you know as opposed to we're not going to have the hero SOC that we're going to pare down and cut parts off, and we're going to uh, uh, band the the silicon wafers as they come off, and and you know kind of dice them up and stuff like that. This is we're going to it's an additive I guess approach to kind of chip design that they're taking here and relying on these ultra fast. Uh, memory connections to kind of support passing information between the two, which is add, which they're able to do very well because it's an SOC and everything's kind of integrated mm -hmm. all together. Not to there's there's less physical distance to have to send it to GPUs and stuff like that. So that to me was the kind of answered that question. I think we assumed that that was going to be the case with how they would scale the M1 stuff, but interesting to see that go through as well. And as Roger pointed out, you know AMD uh, before the show we were kind of talking about this. AMD has kind of paved this path with a lot of their Threadripper stuff, where it's this chiplet kind of design of super fast interconnects gets you lets you scale lots of cores very quickly now this is on an soc uh so uh, uh i you know the only question is I, I guess for those ultra ultra high end workloads the m1 by all accounts you know uh performed very well across a variety of tasks uh outperforming you know intel on kind of a on a on a broad spectrum you know there were certainly cases where it fell down or not as good on a broad spectrum of kind of activities uh, looking good. But, uh, you know, on those ultra high end stuff, that 32 core, it's still an integrated GPU. You know, they were showing about a 30 watt TDP on this, at least according to those vague murky graphs. So uh, uh, that would be my only question, but I'm assuming, you know, that Apple's confident with what they have. Yeah, yeah so and I, I think they were really trying to show it was relativity relative with these graphs, how, you mm -hmm. know, how so far down, you know, the performance is as compared to the original M1 to the new M1 Pro and the M1 Max, just to kind of give, you know, people a visual, just to give you a quick visual view of how far below the standard that Apple has set with their two, well, now three chips. Terrence, you got anything else to add to the chips? Oh, well, I was, I'm not a chip guy, but I definitely say that was one of the reasons why um, I was looking at getting a new Mac because of this new chip, because I've got an older Intel i7 processor, and I don't know if you can hear it, but like I said, my, my <laughs> fan is screaming now, so I'm definitely hoping, you know, getting an M1 Pro will definitely solve all my issues. And like you said, we'll get into the, the pros and the cons of the Macs later, because a lot of people had some... Um, issues with these new Macs that we'll probably get into a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. 
That's right, Terrence. I can hear you over my fans as well, which is why <laughs> I also will be getting a new one. All right, let's talk about it. MacBook Pro 14 and 16 inches. They had the raised feet uh, that people were talking about. They have the physical keys replacing the touch bar. And they brought new ports. They're not new. They're old ports, but they brought them back. <laughs> uh, on the right side, you get the HDMI port. You get a Thunderbolt 4 port with USB-C Thunderbolt 4 port, and you get an SD card slot. Uh, left side, headphone jack, which has some improvements to, to what it could do. That was there already. Two more Thunderbolt 4 slash USB-C ports, and then a MagSafe 3 power slot uh, that you can, you're bringing back the old MagSafe uh, power cord. Uh, you can still charge over the Thunderbolt ports, though, if you've got one of the USB-C uh, power supplies and you want to use that instead, you can take up one of your Thunderbolt 4 USB-C okay. ports with that if you want. Uh, the 14-inch can power two uh, Pro Display XDRs, or actually not the 14-inch, the M1 Pro chip can power two Pro Display XDRs, uh, and the M1 Max can do three displays and a 4K TV. Uh, it has a 24% thinner border, the top border is 60% thinner, and I believe this may be one of the things Terrence was alluding to earlier. There's a notch uh, for a 1080p camera. They did not add face ID, even though that notch is nice and wide. Uh, the menu bar is what will be up there next to the notch and wraps around the notch. Basically, the notch just interrupts the menu bar. Uh, the display can do 120 hertz ProMotion refresh rates. These are mini LED screens. Uh, the solid state drive has 7.4 gigabit per second read rates, twice as fast as the prior gen. Battery life is 17-hour video playback for the 14-inch, 21 hours for the 16-inch. They can fast charge up to 50% of the battery capacity in a half an hour. And the 14-inch starts at $1,999, call it $2,000. 16-inch starts at $2,500. Those can go all the way up to $6,099, $6,100 if you max out the specs. Uh, ordering started already. You can order them right now. Uh, the first ones were available next week, although I'm guessing the shipping dates have started to slip already, and they're available in silver and space gray. So that notch, Terrence, I saw you nodding there. Uh, does it bug you? No, it does not bug me, uh, but I see a lot of people. Battery life, who cares? You know, new chips, yeah, whatever. You know, all these other, you know, features, but it's like the notch really has been a divider for people. When I mean people, the small amount of people in my Twitterverse, right? <laughs> the very small, <laughs> loud people on Twitter, yeah. Right, yeah. the very loud people on Twitter, right? But yeah, I, that seemed like a big deal. Um, but again, like I said, you know, a lot of the issues were with the 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 actual physical parts like i said with the notch and the actual um ports you know a lot of people like hooray for the ports uh touch bar went away everybody said thank god for that which i'm kind of bummed i actually used my touch bar i actually found it very inter not very let me not say integral because that <laughs> means that i like they're gonna really, come for you <laughs> I don't really, really, really use it, but I do use it, especially when I'm like, you know, doing light video editing with Final Cut. So, you know, I'm a little bummed about that. But like it, like you mentioned, people are really bummed out about that notch. Here's here's my prediction. Whenever the teardown happens next week or something like that, there will be the Apple has space for touch or for face ID sensor in notch in new MacBook Pro. I, I may be wrong. That is my prediction. Uh, yeah, the, I mean. I think any ill will of the notch and Apple kind of got in front of it, but it's like, Hey, if you enable dark mode, you can barely see it. Hey guys, you know? Uh, but I, I think all of that is forgiven by like, just the fact that there are ports on this thing and you don't have to live hashtag dongle life uh, as much anymore. The one thing that really shows that like Apple listened to, uh, I, I guess professionals or something like that old but Apple five years ago puts an XQD card reader in there because that's the future of, of card readers, you know, it's the faster card standard or something like that. SD card is by far the most common, so it makes sense, but I'm I am I am, I'm disappointed that we didn't get uh, maybe an Apple one-upsmanship there. Why do you think they went back on the ports? Because the idea with going USB-C slash Thunderbolt 4 for everything was eventually everything will run over those ports, power, uh, display, everything. What, what made them go back and say, well, People still need HDMI ports. People still need 
SD cards. People actually liked MagSafe. That's that's a very unusual thing for Apple to do is to change their mind and go back and bring something back like that. I think it's what you mentioned before where they're kind of catering this this new laptop to to videographers and to photographers. I think they realize that if this is who they're going to kind of make their core audience for this new device, they got to make sure they have enough ports for people to be able to plug in their cameras or their lighting or microphone or whatever the case they may need. They need to give folks the, the reason to say, I need to get this because now I can use all of my peripherals that I need to do this job I'm doing. Yeah, especially if you're going to tout all the video qualities of the chips, you know, the graphics, you know, all the, the speed and, you know, the bandwidth, you know, I guess if, like Nika said, if they're going to cater this towards photographers, I guess they got to have that slot to stick their SD card in. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it did seem for a while that Apple was veering towards consumer with prosumer at the top end. And these feel very much like they're for professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, they are for prosumers and professionals. And so, so yeah, you, you may be right. Uh, well, folks, what do you think? Why do you think they did it? Do you like these? Do you not like them? Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Let us know what you think. All right. We want to give a special thanks to Michelle Sirju, who is one of our top lifetime supporters of DTNS. We really appreciate all those years of support. Yay. And we also want to thank uh, Terrence Gaines and Nika Montford for being on the show. It's an Apple day. So, of course, uh, we had to have them on the show. Uh, guys, where can we find uh, more of your great stuff uh, if we are so inclined? Terrence? Yeah, sure. You can find me on all the social medias at Brother Tech. And you can go to my website, brothertech.com. And you can find me at at Tech Savvy Diva, everywhere in the social media space. You can find our show um, Twitter at SnobOSCast. We're at SnobOSCast everywhere as well. All right. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>